Praise God. Hallelujah. If you go to sleep while I'm preaching tonight, I am going to squirt you with my water bottle. <laughs> Whatever you do, you want to be awake for what God is going to say tonight. Um, also, I believe in full contact preaching. Uh, the word only works when you work it. So you got to respond to the word. You got, I hear that, Lord. I'm going to do this illustration that I was not even intending to do tonight. I'm going to show you how the word works. What's your name? Felicity, come here for a second. Felicity, I want you. Yeah, glory to God. All right, now, hang on. I see with this crowd, we're going to have to set some ground rules. You can respond with your mouth, but not with clapping. Not until I give you clap release. I'm going to have to take away your clap privileges. Otherwise, I ain't going to get through this. It's going to take me a long time, and I fully intend to say everything that God wants me to say tonight. I don't have to sleep. I'm good. So I want to preserve your sleep. So you are able to say amen. An amen. Say amen. amen. A hallelujah. hallelujah. A praise the, praise the Lord. Come on, preacher. Come on, preacher. And, a little, and a wave. Look, it's glory wave. I'm down with all of that. All right? So you can do all of that. That's in your wheelhouse tonight. All right. So um, Felicity, I need you to just sit on the floor. This is how the word of God operates. Okay? Turn toward me. Now, Felicity, I'm going to reach down, and I'm going to grab you and pull you up. But I don't want you to do anything, all right? Do, I'm talking do nothing. I'm glad you sat. I'm actually glad you sat down. Crisscross applesauce is what I call it in my house. So I'm glad you sat down like that. Do nothing. Do nothing. When you listen to somebody preach, all right, when you listen to somebody preach, and all you do is sit there, this is what you're doing. Literally, that person is pulling on an anointing to pour into you, but you become dead weight. And it's really difficult to move you. Now, you're laughing, and I know it's kind of humorous, but this is the reason why a lot of youth groups get stuck. And it seems like youth pastors have to go back and reteach and reteach and reteach, and the same people respond to the same altar calls all the time. You become dead weight and you become inoculated against what it is that the Holy Ghost is trying to do to move you from one place to another place. And it's all because of your response. However, when you respond to the Word of God, turn back around. Now this time, Felicity, listen. I want you to listen very carefully. I don't want you to do anything. You don't have to lift yourself, okay? You can stay crisscross applesauce. All I want you to do is respond to me. Okay? You, don't worry. Don't think, don't overthink it. Your body will know what to do. You just respond to me. Okay? All right, take my hand. Now, respond to me. Good girl. Do it again. Do it again. Have a seat. I'm going to try not to break your kneecaps. <laughs> you don't have to lift your weight. I'm a big dude. I can lift your weight. As a matter of fact, give me your other hand. Put your other hand on here. All right? You don't have to lift your own weight. Just respond to what I'm doing, all right? Just a minute ago, you didn't respond to me. I want you to respond to me this time. Ready? She didn't lift her own weight. All she did was cooperated with the pull. If you'll cooperate with the pull tonight, you won't have to lift your own weight. The Holy Ghost will do the work. All you got to do is cooperate with the pull. I'm going to be pulling on you, but I'm going to need you to cooperate. And as you cooperate with the word, the word can do the work in your life. Somebody say, let the word do the work. Thank you, Felicity. You can have a seat. All right, so let's let the word do the work. Here we go. Open your Bible to Colossians, the second chapter. Thank you, man. Y'all can take just a quick break. You're going to need it. Tonight, we're going to lay hands on everybody in the building. And tonight, we are going to impart into every person in the building. We are going to impart and invoke the blessing on every person in the building. Um, my pastor, Pastor George, 
heard from the Lord two weeks ago that we were to do this in our service. And so we laid hands on every single, on every single child up through our youth group, up through teenagers, up through 18 years old, um, every single person in the building, every single child in the building up to 18 uh, to impart the blessing. And this is what I know is going to happen tonight. Uh, number one, um, if you're in here and you have lived in poverty to this point, the spirit of poverty is going to melt off of you when we impart the blessing because poverty and blessing can't coexist at the same time. If you need healing in your body, you're going to be healed. If you need deliverance, you're going to be delivered. Pornography addictions are going to fall off of people tonight. I'm telling you right now that, that if you've had issues obeying your parents and you, for whatever reason, just have an anger toward your mother, an anger toward your father, it's coming off of you tonight. That anger is coming, and what the Word says, the, the Holy Spirit is going to begin to turn the hearts of the children back toward the fathers. So don't, I'm, I'm telling you this to get you ready for what's going to happen so that you don't turn off. But it's going to require your response and cooperation with the Word. I believe that in this generation, we don't have enough impartation. Paul told Timothy to stir up the gift that was in him through the laying on of hands. We need to lay hands on you as often as we can. As often as we can, because I, I truly believe that this, is, uh, that this is the beginnings of the last generation on the earth before Jesus comes. And we can talk about, I'm not just saying that because it sounds real good with a pre, for a preacher with a microphone to say that we're living in the last days. I'm saying that because I truly believe, based on what I see in the Word and what I see happening with the church, Y'all, did y'all catch that? I didn't say what's happening politically or what's happening in the world. I said what's happening in the church. You see, Jesus is coming back for a bride without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such defect. And for too long, we've been watching what's happening in the world to try to predict when Jesus is coming back. I believe you're going to see what the Bible describes as beginnings of birthing pains in the world. But when you want to know whether or not Jesus is coming back, look at the church. Look at the church. Look at the church. What we saw in the political election this last term was the church actually coming out and being the church. Listen, we've been trying for a long time to get all denominations to think together. It's like herding cats. But whenever we can get the church to start to act right and start to reflect the nature of Jesus, all right, I'm going to leave that alone. I didn't come here to talk about that. So I'm just telling you what's going to happen so that you can begin to prepare yourself and put yourself on one accord with what the anointing is going to do uh, tonight. All right, are you ready? So this is how the Lord told me to do it. Youth pastors, uh, you just go ahead and begin to pray in tongues and prepare yourself right now. Just pray, pray, pray within yourself and begin to prepare yourself. You're going to help with this laying on of hands. Um, and we're going to form a tunnel, and people are going to come through the tunnel. If you're an usher in here or you want to be one, we will swear you in right now. Um, the Bible says that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. On this end, it won't be weeping and gnashing of teeth, but there will be crying and slinging of, slinging of snot. So we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. But we're going to let the Holy Ghost do what the Holy Ghost wants to do. Some of y'all are like, that's sensationalism. Why are you all up there talking about that? It don't, it don't take all that for the, yeah, you're right. It does not take all that for, the move, for, for a move of God. But sometimes when a move of God happens, we need to be willing to allow that. All right? So you're going to have to swallow your pride. And when you swallow your pride, Jesus is going to invade your space. And when Jesus invades your space, everything that Jesus is comes with him. He never comes by himself. He always brings his anointing, his glory, and his power with him. So whenever Jesus steps into the situation, you get affected by all that Jesus is. And the Bible says, actually we're going to read the scripture that says that it pleased God that in him all of the Godhead should dwell bodily. Which means that every part of the Godhead and all that God has to offer is in the person and the personality of Jesus. And that's the power that led you, that saved you, and that lives on the inside of you. And the Bible says that as he is, so are we in the earth, which means that the full force of all that Jesus is can be employed by you if you'll just let him invade your space. Y'all all right? Praise God. Y'all are with me. Hallelujah. I sense an anointing in this house. Anointing in the house. Colossians chapter 2. 
Colossians chapter 2. Actually, that's not where we were supposed to start. We're going to start in Romans chapter 10. Um, All throughout this conference, you've been taught different facets of what it means to be saved. The speakers may not have said that, um, but, but David Winston said something last night that I found very interesting, and I was like, listen, David preaches my sermons all the time. Whenever we minister together, we are always in the same stuff. And I'm like, dude, you going, I don't know what it is. And he, he, he'll text me and be like, the Holy Ghost, let me see your notes. And so I'm just, it's, it's interesting. But he said something. He said, he said, we are dealing with a generation who has an identity crisis or who is in the middle of an identity crisis. And I believe that. I believe that we're dealing with a generation who really, truly is searching for who they are. More, uh, more than that, though, I also believe that we're dealing with a church who's having a salvation crisis. I don't believe we know what it means to be saved anymore. I think somewhere we got caught up on getting people saved and not going to hell that we forgot to tell them the rest of the story. Salvation is not just about you not going to hell. Salvation is about everything that God did so that hell can't affect you while you're on earth. Salvation has to do with a full package, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself in my notes. Salvation has to do with a full package, um, and it is obtained by grace. You didn't do anything to earn it. Through faith, you've got to activate your faith in order to get it. But we forgot to tell people that faith has to then develop beyond just not going to hell and into the acquisition of all of the kingdom. Let me explain what I'm talking about. Faith is a force. Faith is not a noun that you possess, a thing that you possess. It's a force to be released. Rick Renner explains it this way in Hebrews chapter 11 where it says that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He said in his studies he has found that faith, that that describes the behavior of faith. It is what it is, but you've got to understand that that word is in Greek literally is a, is a what did, I want to make sure I get the part of speech right. I'm not even going to try. Um, it's, it's a part of speech that indicates being. So it's not just what it is, it's what it be. So the being of faith is substance, the being of faith is evidence, and so the force of faith behaves like the production of substance and evidence for whatever it is you release your faith for. So if the Word of God says that you are healed and you release your faith for healing, Faith behaves as the substance of that healing. So as you release your faith, you can't help but act like healed people act. Regardless of what the doctor said about you. Regardless of, I'm telling you, listen, this is not something that I just preach to sound real good. I preach this to my daughter. My daughter says, I I, I have a headache or I have the sniffles. I pray for her and I send her tail to school going, now act like healed people act. The the Bible says that as they went, they were healed. So as you go, you are healed. You're not staying home from school. Glory to God. All right, we're going to get into. So the reason I'm setting this stage for faith is you've been instilled with the word this week. And the Bible tells us that faith comes by what? And hearing by the So there have been word deposits that have built your faith to this point all week. The question is, are you going to go home full of faith and not do anything? Or are you going to use the force that has been built in you all week long? In order to do that, you're going to have to come to grips with something. Your salvation is more than what you thought it was. Salvation is not simply being saved from the flames of hell. And I I keep saying that, but I know that we've got to get out of that thought process because people uh, equate sin with going to hell. Understand this, and uh, you're going to have to work with me, okay? Sin does not send you to hell. Sin separates you from God. Now, I'm not giving you a license to sin. That's not what I'm doing. I just want you to have a full, I just want you to know the truth. 
all right? If you've accepted Jesus, your sins have been paid for, both past, present, and future. Because all of your sins were in the future when he died. Unless somebody in here is 2,000 years old. Every last one of your sins were in the future when he died for you. When you accepted him, you accepted the full package that he is. Now that you've accepted that full package, as we begin to unwrap that package, we find that there's more in the package than just deliverance from sin. There's more in the package than just not going to hell. Jesus understood this, and he took a lot of time teaching the disciples about this. I want you to understand something about Jewish culture. In Jesus' day, you could not make yourself like God. Jews went so far to keep themselves from being equal to God that they wouldn't even spell God's name in a manner that would allow you to pronounce it. They took all of the vowels out of Jesus' name, out of God's name. Took all of them out so you couldn't pronounce it. So when Jesus is teaching his disciples and he says, your father in heaven, I bet, I know you ain't supposed to bet, but that, just go with me here. I guarantee you that if you had been on that hill that day and Jesus said, your father in heaven, the whole crowd went, <gasps> because they'd never known Jesus, they'd have never known God as father. The fact that you would tell me that God is my father. Literally, see, this is, we think linear in our Western culture. Jews think cyclical. They think about the whole picture. If I tell you that someone is your father, that means you carry that person's essence. That means you carry that person's likeness. That means you carry that person's DNA. That means all that that person is, is inside of you. So remember back in Genesis chapter 1, when the Bible says, let us create man in our image and in our likeness? In our image and in our likeness is what you create a son as. That's how you create daughters. So when Jesus said, your father in heaven, when they heard that, what fell on their ears was, I have the DNA of my father. That was shocking, so much so that it threatened the religious understanding of the day to the point that it got Jesus killed. So your salvation is not about you not going to hell. That's a given. If it's not about you going to hell, then what is it about? If it's not about you burning, then what is it about? If it's not about just you staying away from the dude with horns on his head, a pointy tail, and a pitchfork, which that ain't how Satan looks anyway. If we understood that, then we'd keep ourselves out of a whole lot more trouble. We're looking for the dude with the pitchfork. The Bible says he masquerades himself as a, as a child or a son or an angel of light. Some of the stuff that you thought was light and right, it ain't. I'm going to stop, 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 stop. Get back over here. Romans chapter 10, verse, starting at verse 6 says, But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend to heaven, that is to bring Christ from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? Which means that faith actually speaks. It has a voice. And it says something. Faith speaks and it has a voice and it says something. It says this, the word is near you in your what? Mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth, that you, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be. Now that is the word that we use to tell people that they're not going to hell. Saved. You're saved. You ain't going to hell. No, nah, girl, you saved. You ain't going to hell. No, nah, dude, we need to get saved so we don't go to hell. But that's not what that word means. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto what? 
salvation. Galatians 2, starting at verse 5, says, Even when we were dead in trespasses, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That doesn't sound like don't go to hell. That sounds like there's a whole lot more involved in salvation than just not going to hell. He raised you up, demonstrated his kindness, and made you sit with him in heavenly places. Now, don't sleep on this because that's not just a cool stadium seat. That seat is a seat of authority where if he's sitting there and you're sitting with him, you're doing what he's doing from his seat. And from his seat, he's ruling and reigning. He's on the throne. And he's the fullness of God himself. You don't qualify to sit there unless you have his qualifications. But you're seated there, which means that by default, you must have his qualifications. Huh. So you mean to tell me that being saved actually means that I have been brought into all that Jesus is. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Jesus already went to hell. What makes you think that you're, not, that you're going to go to hell? He already went there for you. He did so much more. In three days, he defeated death, hell, and the grave. So it's literally not about you not going to hell. Then why does God want me saved? If, if it's not about me going to hell, then why does God want me saved? He wants you saved not so that you don't go to hell, but so that you can establish his kingdom in the earth. Listen to me. I'm not belittling not going to hell. I'm glad I ain't going to hell. I read some stuff about hell. Hell is a rough place. I'm too pretty for hell. (laughs) I'm too pretty for hell. They put you in general population in hell. You don't get solitary confinement or nothing. Like, ain't no specific cells. They don't discriminate. They just put you out there with Bubba and the rest of them. I am not trying to go to hell. I promise you, I stay saved. Listen, in my, in my own personal life, I believe that there's some stuff, there's some activity going on in hell that I just don't like. Like, one of the things that I hate doing is setting chairs in a sanctuary. I will do anything. I'll clean the toilets. I'll paint the building. But I do not like setting chairs because I'm just not good at it. If I had set these chairs in here, we'd all be sitting at diagonals, and I'd be preaching like this trying to catch all of your eye gaze because you wouldn't be able to see me. You'd all, all, the, all the rows would be jacked up. And I believe that in hell, one of the jobs is going to be you have to set chairs. <laughs> and then right when you finish, a three-year-old is going to come jack up all the chairs. And then you have to reset the chairs. And you do that for eternity. So I stay saved. I don't want you to think that I'm belittling salvation from damnation. But you've not, and we're going to demonstrate this later, but you've not just been saved from something, you've been saved to something. And if you don't understand that you've been saved to something, you have to understand that you've been saved to something more than you understand that you've been saved from something. Because at a certain level in your faith walk, hell just becomes not an option. It's not even a thought in your mind anymore. Brother Copeland heard, heard the Lord tell him this. He said, he, he, told the, he told Brother Copeland, he said, Kenneth, if it hadn't been for sin, I'd have never had a serious thought. I, said, I heard him say that, and it took my breath. He said it took his breath when the Lord said it. I said it took my breath when he said, what? Can you think about God not having a serious thought? But we sing a worship song that says he's a good, good father. Listen. My kids sometimes break the rules. And if it had never been for my kids ever breaking the rules, I would have never had a serious thought toward my children. It'd be all hunky-dory. We'd always have fun. We'd be high-fiving. They'd eat more ice cream than they, uh, than they eat right now. 
I, I wouldn't have no paddles, nothing, nothing. Some of y'all are like, what, paddles? I believe in discipline the way the Bible says it. Anyway, so just saying. So Brother Copeland said that God told him that if it had not been for sin, that he'd have never had a serious thought. Wow. Wow. So what that means is, since you've been redeemed from sin, you can get to a place where you don't think about hell. I'm not afraid of whether or not I'm going to hell, even when I miss it. It doesn't even cross my mind, John, you're going to go to hell. What? That, that, is the, that is the easiest way for the devil to blow his cover in my life. If he, if he says, you know what you just did, now you're going to hell for that. I'm like, stop talking to me. I know that ain't God. I know that that's not God. You've got to get to a place where you know that that's not God. You tell a lie and get hit by a Mack truck, you're not going to hell. Why? Because salvation is not that fickle. The blood of Jesus is not that weak and watered down. His blood is still crying mercy, even when you're not crying mercy. So you've got to understand that it's not about hell. It's about you living heaven right now. You have eternal life. Your eternal life does not start when you die. Your eternal life starts right now. It started the moment you said yes to Jesus. For the rest of your life, all of your breaths, and then when you don't even need breath anymore, you will be living in eternity. We don't die like normal people die. We have a totally different exit strategy, baby. All we do is close our eyes, and when we open our eyes again, we see Jesus. Read your Bible. It says, he tasted death once for all. For all. Back to this, Lord have mercy, back to my notes. So this word saved is the Greek word sozo. Now I want you to understand what all is in your package. Watch this. The Greek word sozo means to rescue, to deliver, to heal, to preserve, to make well, to make whole, to save, get this, to save from the evils that prevent one from stepping into the blessing. To to preserve, to heal, to make whole, but more than that, to save from the evils that prevent one from stepping into the blessing. Listen, your sin will not send you to hell if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. However, your sin will stop you from stepping into the fullness of the blessing, not because the blessing has been taking, taken away from you, but because you choose to not stay in the place of the blessing. The Bible says of God that there is no shadow of turning in God, which means that he is always consistent. He's doing the same thing all the time. He's consistent. He's consistent. He's consistent which means that if there are blessings being poured out, he's always, he's always pouring blessings out according to his word. The moment you step outside the realm of the word, you step outside the realm of the blessing. But the moment you step back into the realm of the word, you step back into the realm of the blessing. Listen to this scripture. And the, this thing is asking me if I want to erase all my notes. That would be real bad because I'd just preach until I hit the mark and you'd be here until tomorrow. Colossians chapter 2, that's where I tried to get you to go before, verses 2 through 4 says this, I am contending for you that your hearts will be wrapped in the comfort of heaven and woven together into love's fabric. That is not a scripture to dead people. You'd be wrapped in the comfort of heaven. You mean not tell me I can have the comfort of heaven right here on earth? He was writing to the church at Colossae. That doesn't apply to dead people. That applies to you. Listen, this will give you access to all the riches of God as you experience the revelation of God's great mystery, which is Christ, the anointed one and his anointing. For our spiritual wealth is in him like hidden treasure waiting to be discovered. 
heaven's wisdom and endless riches of revelation knowledge. I want you to know this so that no, actually, you know what I think I, no, I didn't skip scripture. I want you to know this so that no one will lead you into error through their persuasive arguments and clever words. Preaching about hell sounds real good and it's awfully persuasive. I can get a whole room of third graders saved by preaching hell. Because no third grader wants to go to hell. They would all respond to the altar call. Hell is scary. Hell is scary. Even the little Muslim kids would be like, "Uh uh-uh, I'm trying to go to hell. (laughs) That man said, no, I'm, I'm going right on up to the altar because I'm not trying to go to hell. It sounds like the dark place. That sounds like the place under my bed. I ain't going to hell. I'm going to go up there and do whatever this man says so I don't go to hell. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is what you've been saved for, what you've been saved into. It says that you can discover your spiritual wealth in him like hidden treasure. Verse 6 of the same scripture says, In the same way you receive Jesus, our Lord and Messiah, by faith, Continue your journey of faith, progressing further into your union with him. Your spiritual roots go deeply into his life as you, continue, as you are continually infused with strength, encouraged in every way. So if, if salvation doesn't mean don't go to hell, then what does it mean? Galen, let's go ahead and bring those up here. I need two volunteers. You're going to have to be, you're going to have to have perseverance. I promise you're going to need perseverance. You are going to need some serious perseverance. You think you can do it, buddy? Come on, let me, let me have you. All right, glory to God. And let's see. I see people waving at me. But I am not going to choose thee. Come on, little man. Come on. Come on. I don't know why I chose two little dudes, but that's where the Lord is right now. I want you to go up, go up here on the stage. Get up on the stage right here. Get up on the stage. I want one of you. Actually, you know what, y'all? One is wearing black and one is wearing white. This is perfect. <laughs> Buddy, you stay right here. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm talking about. You excited. Come here. Stand right here. Galen, I'm going to move this table over to the side. And um, I want to give... What's your name, man? What's your name? Ibrahim. Abraham. Ibrahim? Abraham. 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 Yeah. Abraham. Glory to God. My name's Nate Dog, kids. Nate Dog. Nate Dog. It's really Nathan. It's really Nathan, but Nate Dog sounds a whole lot better, don't it? You don't know it, but that man's been working on that. He was like, I'm going to go to conference this weekend, and the moment I get an opportunity to tell everybody my name, Nate Dog is what's coming out. <laughs> Nate Dog. All right, Abraham, I need you. And your name is Abraham. God hooked me up tonight, boy. God hooked me up. I want you to hold this. You're going to have to hold it with both hands. I kind of made it a little heavy. Hold it down here. Hold it right down here. There you go, buddy. There you go. And you're just going to hang on to it, all right? And I want... Nate dog, to hold that. All right, you got it? All right. Listen, here's the thing about salvation. There are only two positions in all of the world. There's only two positions in all of the world. There is the blessing and the curse. The Bible literally describes everything, everything, from these two positions. There is, I want you to hear me, there's nothing in the Bible that is not described from these two positions. And God only makes two distinctions. Either you are blessed or you are Cursed. Now, the interesting thing about this is God does not send people to hell. Nor can the devil make you go to hell. I know that just shocked your whole world. 
But hear me out. God does not send people to hell, nor can the devil make you go to hell. The Bible says that God lays a choice in front of you. He says, I, chew, I lay before you today life and death, blessing and curse. You get to choose. So there's only two positions. Now, Aubrey, come here. Now, I, I, I don't want you to think that I'm just making stuff up. We're going to read scripture that support this. But here's the thing. When you are born into the world, the Bible says that because of the fall of Adam, you were born into iniquity. Iniquity is bigger than just sin because sin denotes activity that is against the law. Iniquity literally means when you are born into the world, you are born under the curse. Nate Dog, I love you, homie, but that's my daughter. Hold that pole, boy. Hold that pole. Whatever you do, hold the pole. All right? So glory to God. You are born under the curse. When you decide by grace through what? Uh, you're going to have to come stronger than that. By grace through. Faith. By grace through. Faith. By grace through. Faith. Here's another key to your Bible study. Everything in the kingdom also operates by that formula. You're saved by grace through faith. But this package of salvation has within it everything that you're going to need to live a life of blessing. So you're healed by grace through faith. You're delivered by grace through through faith. You're set free by grace through faith. You pay for college by grace through faith. You raise your kids by grace through faith. You talk to your mama by grace through faith. It's what you did not, you didn't do anything to earn it, but you use your faith according to the word of God to take it. When you accept Jesus, you are transferred the title of this message is The Transfer. You are transferred from the curse into the blessing. There are only two positions. The world would have you think that this is a position. It's not. It's not. If this was a position then your sin could send you to hell. If you told a lie, that could send you to hell. Why? Because you're in a gray area, which means you're constantly teeter-totting back and forth between heaven and hell. But that's not what the Word says. That's not the gospel. The gospel does not say that you are in a place of limbo and you get to be pushed one way or the other like a needle. No, the gospel says that you were here and Jesus told Nicodemus that in order to see the kingdom, not in order to go to heaven, not in order to stay out of hell, but in order to see the kingdom, you have to be born again. Why? Because that which is born of flesh is flesh, and flesh receives the curse. However, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, watch how Colossians paints this picture. Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 12, says this, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light, which is the opposite of dark. It's the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. So once you've been, not just sin, one, but sins, plural, which means once you've been forgiven of sins, sins can have no power over you anymore. You are not the sum total of your activity. You're not what you do. You are what you're called, and you're called a son of God. You're called holy. You're called righteous. 
And what you do can't change what you're called. All right, let me, uh, listen, I know I'm talking to teenagers, and you're like, you can't tell them that because they're going to go out and do stupid. If I remember my teenage years correctly, you're going to go out and do stupid anyway. I'm just trying not to get you, I'm trying to get you to a place where you understand that you don't have to go out and do stupid to be somebody. You're already somebody. If you're going to do stupid, do stupid in the name of Jesus. Do what the world calls stupid. We are abnormal individuals. We are not normal. We do stuff. We do crazy stuff. We tell you stuff like bring 100% of your money, take 10% of your money, and you can do more with the 90% that's left than what you could do with the 100%. That's stupid to the world's economy because the world's economy says if you subtract 10% from the 100%, you only have 90%, and obviously you're going to be able to do less with the 90% than you would be able to do with the 100%. But God says if you'll give me that 10%, I'll bless the rest of the 90, and it'll I'll strip anything anybody else can do with that 90%. You're not talking about the natural baby. You're talking about the supernatural. Watch what it says. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, which means nothing takes him by surprise. The devil can't create anything. All he does is pervert stuff. Listen, the devil didn't, cre- the devil didn't create sex. He just perverted it. The devil didn't create money. He just perverted it. The devil didn't create music. He just perverted it. The devil didn't create dance. He just perverted it. Don't you ever let anybody from a religious... Let me stop before I get in trouble. Crank the car up. We need to go. (laughs) Don't you ever let anybody tell you that you cannot dance. David danced before the Lord. There's all kinds of dancing going on in the Bible. You just don't need to dance and get out there and gyrate stuff that you don't belong to gyrating. Nobody want to see all that. Stop that. You think you look like Beyonce's last video. <laughs> when truly, well, I'm not going to tell you what you look like. But anyway, <laughs> listen to this in the Passion Translation, same scripture. Your hearts can soar with full gratitude when you think of how God made you worthy to receive the glorious inheritance freely given to us by living in the light. He has rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness and has translated us, another word for translated is transferred, us into the kingdom realm of his beloved son. So when you get saved, you move from the curse. Y'all all right? Y'all still good? Okay, I told you this is going to be a heavy assignment. Y'all all right? All right. Nate, me and you going to have to have a conversation. Anyway, <laughs> you go from being under the curse to being, un- come on, Abraham, get up here for, for me. She need to be under the blessing. Being under the blessing. Now, listen to this. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, in the New International Reader's Version says this. God is able to shower all kinds of blessings upon you. Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 26 says, I will bless my people and their homes around my holy hill. And, and, and in the proper season, I will send the showers they need and they will be showers of blessings. So the Bible is replete with examples of how God intends to shower you with blessing. But how many of you know that if once you are in the shower, you begin to get wet? But when you take yourself out of the shower and dry yourself off, the water stops. That does not mean that the shower lost its ability to wet you, nor does it mean that the shower can't perform what it was intended to perform. All it means is that, baby, you step out of the shower, which means you can't experience all that God has for you. 
But the moment you get a revelation from the word of God and decide, I'm going to step back into the shower. The shower never left its position and it's going to wet you with all the blessings that God has for your life. Some of you have been condemned in yourself because you stepped out of the shower. Listen, pornography is just a step out of the shower. Sex before marriage, just a step out of the shower. Cursing your mama out, just a step out of the shower but you never step back into the curse you only step out of the shower all you gotta do is step back into the shower tonight we're gonna lay hands on you and you're stepping back into the shower I'm getting excited listen to me listen to me you can't get dirty as long as you stay in the shower. And some of y'all have been doing some stuff that has made you feel dirty. And because you feel dirty, you can't worship like you used to worship because there's still a residue of what you've been doing. Some of you have been thinking some thoughts that have made you feel dirty and unworthy. And because of those thoughts, you feel like you don't qualify to step into the presence of God. So you have to put on this front like you're hard, like you are the man or like you are the woman and nothing can get to me. I got to make sure that you understand that nothing you say to me is going to sink down into my spirit. I'm not going to be weak like these other people. I'm going to put on this front like nothing bothers me. But baby, on the inside of you, everything about you is broken and dirty and you're afraid that anybody's going to, if anybody's going to see the real you. So you put on the hardest exterior possible hoping that nobody gets to you and the devil is content with that the devil knows that he can't send you to hell and he can't recurse what God has already blessed so all he wants you to do is stay right here just don't get back into the shower whatever you do don't step back into the blessing I know I can't force you back into the curse but if you'll just stay right here you won't experience what God has for you in the blessing and your hard exterior is forcing you into a position where you have to maintain your stance and your stance is right here but if you would just compromise your pride for two seconds the Holy Ghost will come push you back into the shower somebody is wondering why people fall whenever hands are laid on you listen I can't prove it in the Bible but you can't disprove it I believe that sometimes when God has people lay hands on folks they're just falling back into the shower I'm just falling back into the blessing. I'm just falling back into what I used to be. I'm just, excuse me, I'm just falling back into what I used to be. See, you wonder why people run in church. Some, for whatever reason, we've thought that running in church has escaped this generation, and you look at old people like they done lost their mind. Well, baby, if you knew what they were running for, you'd run too. If you knew what they were running for, you'd run too. I got a good friend who's a Christian rapper, his name's Minister, and he said, don't judge me for running because I used to run from the police. Hey. Back to the word. (laughs) Whenever I feel the anointing start to wane, I just head back to the word. Colossians chapter 1 verse 19 in the Passion Translation says this, for God is satisfied to have all the fullness dwell in Christ and by the blood of his cross, everything in heaven and earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again, even though you were once distant from him, living in the shadows. Living in the shadows, living in the, I hear that, Lord. I hear that. Some of you have been living in the shadows. Well, Pastor John, what is living in the shadows? Well, anything that doesn't happen in the light happens in darkness. But for whatever reason, you've been convinced that if I can just stay in neutral ground, I'll be all right. I'm not going to get real, real holy, but I'm also not going to live this life that y'all talk about. I'm just on the fence about some things, and I'm still trying to make up my mind. 
That's called compromise. That's called compromise. Either you is or you ain't. And I truly believe this, that some of the depression that we have in the, that we have in the world is brought on by people trying to be something that they're not. And some, listen to me, I'm going to say this right up on the microphone. You can turn me down in the back if you need to. But some of the depression in the church is saved folks trying to act unsaved. Some of the depression in the church has to do with you know what God's called you to do, but you, won't want, you don't want to surrender to that fully. So it's easier for you to find identity in your hurt than it is in the blessing. Y'all all right? I'm just saying. Depression, from my experience, and I know every, every um, clinical individual will say, well, you know, there's a certain thing of the, the chemical balances in your brain. I don't discount that. I don't discount that at all. Glory to God. Thank God for doctors and those who are practicing uh, in the area of psychology and psychiatry. I, I believe that they have a place in the kingdom and that their gift is useful. But I want you to understand something. God is still God. And the God of the universe can deliver you from depression in an instant. In, a, in an instant. How can he do that? Because when God touches you, the full force of all of your real identity comes on you. When you know who you are, you'll understand that some things are just beneath you. You're better than some stuff. Some stuff's just beneath you. So when the Bible says you've been seated with him, you're just better than that. You're just better than that. You're better than that. That's going to have to help some of y'all. Some of y'all are going to go back and you're going to look at some people and be like, I'm better than that. And they're going to be like, what, girl, are you trying to tell me you better than me? Nope, nope, not better than you, just better than that. Not better than you, just better than that. I'm better than that. Let me keep reading. Hallelujah. Where was I? In the shadows of your evil thoughts and actions, he reconnected you back to himself. He released his supernatural peace. There's that, there's that healing from depression right there. He released his supernatural peace to you through the sacrifice of his own body as a sin payment on your behalf so that you would dwell in his presence. So sin's already been paid for. Now watch this. And now there is nothing between you and Father God. For he sees you as holy, flawless, and restored. There's only one catch. If indeed you continue to advance in faith. If you continue to grow your faith past hell, then you'll come in full contact with the fact that he sees you as holy, blameless, and flawless. And when you understand that he sees you as flawless, even in your flaws, he calls you holy before you have even understood what holy means. He calls you righteous because he's righteous. God doesn't even see you anymore. He sees his son when he looks at you. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, and then we're going to start laying hands on folks. Our faith in Jesus transfers God's righteousness to us and now declares us flawless in his eyes. This means that we can now enjoy and enjoy true and lasting peace with God, all because of, our, all because of what our Lord Jesus, the anointed one, has done for us. Our faith guarantees us permanent access into this marvelous kindness that has given us perfect relationship with God. What incredible joy bursts forth from us as we keep celebrating our hope of experiencing God's glory. Now, I want you to understand, you said, well, God, Pastor John, you said we were going to pray over uh, poverty. What does any of this have to do with poverty? There are only two positions. I'm just saying, I didn't change my mind. There are only two positions. There's curse 
and there's blessing. As long as you stay out of this and stay right here, then the full force of the blessing is on you. Let me help you. How many of you remember what Pastor David said the definition of blessing is? Anybody remember that? It was a famous president's name, Barak, which means what? Empowerment. I want you to understand something. The blessing is not money. I know I just shocked you again. I feel like I'm having to resuscitate y'all every five minutes. The blessing is not money. The blessing is the power. And it's the power to obtain whatever God has for you. See, what you call valuable, heaven calls pavement. I'm serious. Y'all ain't never heard the story? There's a man who died, went to heaven. They told him, hey, listen, we don't do this for everybody, but since you're here and it's Friday and we're going to, you know, cut you some slack, you can go back to earth and grab one thing that's valuable to you and bring it back. And so the man went back. He was trying to figure out what he was going to grab. He grabbed something. He brought it back. And when he got back to the gate, they opened the bag and said, what? And they pulled it out and said, we let you go back to earth to grab one thing that's valuable, and you brought back pavement, and he brought back gold. In heaven, gold is pavement. They build gates with diamonds and crystals and emeralds. Diamonds, crystals, and emeralds are construction material. Diamonds, crystals, and emeralds are hammers and nails and staples and sheetrock, baby. Really? Really? You freaking out over paying for college? God is in the business of putting money in fish's mouths. If you walk into the admissions office full of the glory, then you might just walk in and people start weeping under the power and go, we don't know where, 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 you're, where, where nothing of yours, uh, your computer wiped out and everything says you're paid for it. And we know that we don't have any check with your name on it, but for whatever reason, I feel something just sweep over me when you walk into the building, baby. A power surge just walked into the building. I know some of y'all are too cool to believe that y'all like. <laughs> Let it happen to you one time. One time. One time. You'll be a broken mess. Just, ah, Jesus. <laughs> Listen to this. Watch the blessing. Deuteronomy chapter 8, 18, and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. God does not give you wealth. He gives you the power to get wealth. God does not give you wealth. He gives you the power to get wealth. God does not give you wealth. He gives you the power to get wealth. God will do stuff like put you around wealthy people with an assignment to bless your life. God will do stuff like give you an idea that you couldn't have ever thought of because you ain't smart like that. God will do stuff like hand you stuff that you can go turn into money. God will put you in situations around people who have influence over realms of economy that you don't know anything about. Ask me how I know. Ask me how I know. You're looking at a dude from the projects of Atlanta. I'm from the hood, baby. The ghetto. I'm from the bricks. And I get the opportunity to go to lunch with the man. How do I tell this? Oh, do you think that's going to be all right? Okay. I get an opportunity to sit down at a table with the man whose family owned the largest chicken processing company in the United States of America. His name is Buddy Pilgrim. Anybody ever heard of Pilgrim's Pride? Pilgrim's Chicken? He's on the board of our ministry. And I sit and talk to him about 
wealth strategy. And he teaches me from the word wealth strategy. You can go online at emic.org, search his name, and get his teachings yourself. I'm from the projects. When I tell you God will put you in touch with people that can change your life, and listen, Buddy Pilgrim is not giving me any money, just wisdom, and that's worth a whole lot more than money. That's worth a whole lot. If I could just sit and take notes and breathe your air, because you've been breathing money's air. So if I figured if I inhale some of what you're inhaling, then we're going to be all right. I get to sit under the teaching that I sit. I don't qualify, except I qualify. The blessing is on me. The blessing is on me. And the blessing can be on you. All you got to do is decide that you ain't too cool for the blessing. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 22 and 23. Y'all get ready. We're going to start laying hands on folks. The benevolent man leaves an inheritance to, that endures to his children's children, but the wealth of the wicked is treasured up for the righteous, which means that all wicked money is reserved for you if you'll just stay in the blessing. Now watch this. The lovers of God will live, long, live a long life and get to enjoy their wealth but the ungodly will suddenly perish. Last scripture, Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 26. There is a divine mystery, a secret surprise that has been concealed from the world for generations, but is now being revealed, unfolded, and manifested for every holy believer to experience. All the ones that will stay in the blessing. Watch this. Living within you is the Christ who floods you with the expectation of glory. This mystery of Christ embedded within us becomes a heavenly treasure chest of hope filled with the riches of glory in his people, and God wants everyone to know about it. Christ is our message. We preach to awaken hearts and, every, uh, and bring every person into the full understanding of the truth. It has become my inspiration and passion in ministry to labor with tireless intensity, with the power flowing through me to present to every believer the revelation of being his perfect one in Jesus. That's so much more than you going to hell. You get a revelation of this, you'll start living heaven right now. You'll start living heaven right now are there any outstanding bills in heaven any foreclosures happening in heaven i'm serious you just take a just take a just take a test of the weather of heaven is there any repossession happening in heaven I, I, anybody getting kicked out of their house in heaven anybody defaulting on their rent in heaven any bad credit scores in heaven i'm, I'm just saying is anybody working at a pawn shop in heaven Anybody having to hawk their grandmama's ring in heaven? And this says that I get to live heaven right now. You got to stop settling for stuff. You can go into your school building and begin to establish heaven in your school. Why? Because the full force of your faith is greater than the full force of wickedness. There's something called the force of righteousness. All you got to do is start living righteous, and people around you will start doing righteous. Can I just tell you one more testimony about that? I went to, um, I got a friend who is very influential, and so we have, we, we got box seats at the, um, at the um, um, what do you call it, Cowboy Stadium, Jerry World, AT&T Stadium, box seats to go and see the monster truck uh, um, competition. My son loved it. Love them for like four hours. And he ate every minute of it up. Every single minute of it. Well, in this, in this uh, box, I don't know if you've ever sat in uh, a skybox. I mean, we've sat in some before. We, we're sports people. We like football. Um, and roll tide. And um, see, now we untipped our hands. There are going to be people walking through the line not receiving because I said that. And so um, we go and we're sitting there 
And on the way up, we're getting our food. Now, not knowing that, that there's going to be some stuff up there already, but we're getting our food. And this guy comes and says, hey, up in the box, you know, that there's, there's anything you want to drink. And I was like, well, glory to God, hallelujah. He said, yeah, there's all kinds of beer up there, and you can just have whatever you want for free. And I said, I don't drink. And he looked at me like a calf at a new gate. He said, what do you mean you don't drink? I said, I don't drink. He said, if you don't drink, then what do you do? As if drinking means that I, if I don't drink, I don't do anything. I just, I guess I just sit at home and twiddle my thumbs. <laughs> and so um, I told him I don't drink. And he said, oh, okay. Um, and then my friend was like, yeah, he's a preacher. He don't drink. He says, well, that don't mean anything. I know plenty of preachers who drink. Yeah. That's another teaching, Jesus. I'm glad we already took up the offering. Because I'm going to mess up somebody's weekend plans. Anyway. So, um, so he, <laughs> I'm glad it's Friday night. Y'all, y'all lingering with me. You know, the old folks used to call this tarrying. is when you just stay in the presence. And so, um, so he goes, I know plenty of preachers. That, um, that drink. And I went, not this preacher. And, he's, and he looked at me and he said, oh, you must be one of those talk the talk, walk the walk kind of preachers. And I said, there's no other way to do it. Now, the whole time my eight-year-old son is sitting there watching this conversation back and forth like a ping pong match. He's just trying to figure out what I'm going to say next. Like, I'm going to just give in, and I'm noticing that he's there watching. Now, listen, he's going to be in a position one day when he has to stand up for righteousness. And so he's watching this exchange go back and forth. Like, is daddy going to drink something? Is daddy not going to drink something? Does daddy drink beer? I don't even know what beer is, but apparently it's bad. So watch this. We get up to the box, right? And I open the refrigerator. Because I'm out of diet, Dr. Pepper. I open the refrigerator, and lo and behold, I'm talking about every beer that, to me, I don't know what all kinds of beers are in existence right now. It's been a long time since I drank beer. But every beer, to me, to, in existence, is there for a sampling. You can just have whatever you want, just beer. And two little rows of diet, Dr. Pepper. And I'm like, praise God, that person heard from the Lord and put some Diet Dr. Pepper in here. So I grab a Diet Dr. Pepper, close the door, turn around, and it seemed like everybody in the skybox was watching me like this. <laughs> Trying to figure out why I went to the refrigerator. I cracked open my Diet Dr. Pepper, poured in my ice, went back over there, and sat and watched it. <laughs> and my son was just watching me going, Okay. I go back and forth to that refrigerator until we run out of Diet Dr. Peppers because apparently these jokers started drinking my Diet Dr. Peppers. I'm like, they got beer in here for you. They ain't got nothing in here for me but Diet Dr. Pepper. Why are you still drinking my Diet Dr. Pepper? Don't you want a dose egg keys or something? Stay thirsty, my friend. But I want you to listen to this. I want you to listen to this. In the refrigerator, there are rows of beer that are very neatly placed into this refrigerator. I went to that refrigerator once the event was over, hoping to find a remnant of a Diet Dr. Pepper for the road. I found none. But I'm going to tell you what I did find. Out of all the rows of beer that were in that refrigerator, only one was missing. I told my pastor that, and Pastor Terry looked at me, and she said, John, that's the force of righteousness. She said, you didn't have to tell those men not to drink a beer, but the force of righteousness coming off of you convicted them to the point to where they wouldn't do it in your presence. And I only saw one person that I, I was reflecting on it. I only saw one person walking around the box with a beer, and as he walked by me, he was like this. Glory to God. I'm like, calm down, brother. You ain't going to go to hell. 
It's going to be all right. I wanted to preach him this message. I'm like, it's going to be okay. He's like, he don't drink beer. The pastor don't drink beer. Oh, Jesus, what I do with this beer? Why do I have the beer? I'm convinced that he did not drink that beer, that he just shook it all out. That's the force of righteousness. You take that back into the locker room at your school. Take that to your school's hallway. Say, just say, I'm going to carry my Bible whether y'all like it or not. I'm going to pray in tongues whether you like it or not. I'm going to call on Jesus whether you like it or not. Excuse me, everybody. I'm going to bless my food whether you like it or whether you don't like it. And watch what happens when somebody's mama needs prayer or somebody's daddy needs prayer or somebody is going through a hard time. Somebody break up with their boyfriend. Somebody break up with their girlfriend. Somebody turn up pregnant. You watch what happens. The force of righteousness will change your atmosphere. Yeah, Lord, I hear that. All right. God said it's enough preaching. Time to start praying. Faith has already been cultivated. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, Nate. Dog, you made it, dog. Yeah. Get in the shoot. What? <laughs> Glory to God. All right. Here's what I want to happen first. First of all, y'all turn on your faith right now. Turn your faith on. Turn your faith on. If you pray in the Holy Ghost, just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Turn your faith on. Turn your expector on. I want every youth pastor, if you are a youth pastor, if you are a youth pastor, not if you're a youth leader. Youth leaders, I have an assignment for you too. But if you are a youth pastor, I want you to come down here and I need two rows. I need a row of people facing this way and a row of people facing this way. And give me a little bit of relief here and a little bit of relief here. If you're a youth pastor, come on down. Come on down. Just begin to form two rows, shoulder to shoulder, some facing this way and some facing that way. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost on this. Jesus! I already sense the presence of God. I already sense the presence of God. Give me some right here, brothers. Just a few right here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Make sure we're even down there. If you're a senior pastor in the house, you come on up here and be a part of this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Glory. Just keep praying. Just keep praying. Give me a minute. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I command the blessing on these men. The youth pastors? Youth pastors? No. I command the blessing, the blessing on these men and women right now, in Jesus' name, as they impart into this generation, Father, as they impart into this generation. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, as they impart into this generation, All right, if you're a youth worker, if you're a youth worker, this is what I want. I want you to just strategically place yourself along this line right on the outside of these guys because there are going to be people coming through here. They're going to get their hands, get hands laid on them, and some of them are going to fall out in the Holy Ghost. You may have to carry some people through the line, but we're going to need to move them on through the line. Listen, if that's you, just ignore what I'm saying. You do what the Holy Ghost does with you. All right? You do what we'll, we will take care of the rest. You do what the Holy Ghost does with you. Don't you dare limit God. Don't limit God tonight. Don't limit God tonight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So if you're, if, you're a youth, if you're a youth leader, I need you to just strategically place yourself along this line. Just spread yourself out along this line. Just spread yourself out along this line. Let's try to keep this line moving this way. You guys, you, yeah, youth pastors, that's good, that's good. Good. Brittany, come here so we can even this out. Just right there. All right. Where's Lorenzo? Lorenzo? All right. Are you you've organized? We, are we coming this? We're coming this way, right? This way. All right. Listen. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Li oh, I hear that, Lord. Asthma is being healed right now. Asthma. Asthma is being healed right now. 
Just go ahead and take a breath. You can breathe better right now. It's already manifesting. You just breathe. Just breathe in. Better than Promethean mist. Just breathe in. Just inhale. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now, this is what's going to happen. I need that section, then this section, then this section. We're going to come through this way and out this way. And you're going to go back to your seat. Hallelujah. 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 Band, I need, I need it high the whole time. I need it high the whole time. This is a celebration. This is a celebration. This is a celebration. Ready? Let's go. Glory to God. I'm my sick heaven.
Glory to God. Keep praying. Keep praying. This is what I heard in my spirit. I heard in my spirit that as people are coming through this line, as people are coming through this line, they're getting clean. The residue of sin is falling off of people and you're getting clean. So right now, as you come through the line, you begin to accept that. Begin to stir your faith up for that.
break every chain. I hear, I hear, I hear the chains falling. Oh, see. 
If you believe that, sing it out. You have no rival. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name. Yours is the name above all. Come on, just confess and declare. And yours is the name above all. One more time, sing. Yes, yours is the name above all. Come on, and what a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. understand what you're singing when you're singing you have no rival and you have no equal 
That means that there's nothing that is on his level. And you're seated with him. So if he has no rival, you have no rival. If he has no equal, you have no equal. If death couldn't hold him, death can't hold you. There's nothing separating you from the throne room. So I want us to sing that just from, from, from death could not hold you. And I want you to understand the fullness of what you're saying. And as you say it, let's not just say it, let's celebrate it. Don't just say it, celebrate it. Come on, come death on, Death could on. not hold you. The veil torn before you. You silence the post of sin and grace. With your own words, tell him how much you love him. Father, we love you. God, I thank you so much for what you've done here. Father, we love you with an undying love. Father, find in the earth a group of people who are willing to carry out your will and do it your way. Father, find in the earth a generation of people who will not compromise. God, find in the earth a generation of people who have been reserved for your glory. Find in the earth a generation of people who've not bowed their knee to an idol. Find in the earth, God, a generation of people who are unashamed of your name. Find in the earth a generation of people who have you tattooed on their arm and on their heart and in their mind. Find in the earth carriers of your word. Find in the earth, God. Find in the earth faith. Find earth, find in the earth faith, Father, in Jesus' name. <sighs> Pastor David, I could do this all night. I only got one more thing to do. Raquel and Lorenzo, come here. Lorenzo, stand right here. Raquel, you stand on his right. And this may mess up the camera shot. Stand right next to her. Step this way. Step this way. Step forward. Step forward. There's something that happens. When the preaching of the word is combined with the singing of the word. And there's an anointing that is a multiplied anointing. 
God doesn't do anything in addition. He does everything in multiplication. That's why sowing and reaping works. Is when you sow one seed, you don't get two out of the ground. When you sow one seed, you get multiplied seeds out of the ground. So in the word of God, where it says two will become one, it literally indicates a multiplying of every part of the good anointing that's on those individuals and the elimination of that which does not please God. You will find in your life together, Pastor David, Pastor Monica, y'all come on up here with me. You will find in your life together that everything that it takes to make the the individuals better is found in the other one. Everything it takes to make you better will be found in her. And everything it takes to make you better will be found in him. And the covenant which you guys are going to establish will be a covenant to allow that to come out of your union. It's the promise that God has made to the two of you that he will never leave you nor forsake you, but that the full force of his kingdom will be demonstrated in you. And everything you touch will have multiplied anointing on it. Every song you write will have multiplied anointing on it. When you surrender your calling to him, every song and every sound that comes out of your mouth will have multiplied anointing. When you surrender your calling to her, every word you preach will heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. You'll find yourself doing more than you've ever done. And everything that you dream, everything that you cried out to God for, everything that you've asked the Lord to do for you, Yeah, yeah, the things that you've prayed for your families. Yeah, the things that you've prayed for your families. The ones that you're believing will come into the kingdom. They'll see your marriage and they'll go, how did they do it? And they'll want to know what God you serve. Multiply salvation multiplied miracles and because you're submitted because you're submitted and you're willing to be taught an abundance of wisdom will overtake the household that you establish people will walk through the doors and wonder how someone so young can know so much about how the kingdom operates and I say concerning you that in your future, there is a church. There is a church. There's a church. There is a church. But God is going to take you through a process to prepare you for the end call. God is going to take you through a process to prepare you for the end call. Now, listen to me. To whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, much is required. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't fight people. We don't fight people. But whatever you do, protect the anointing. Just like you've protected the anointing for your pastors, who are also your mom and dad, protect the anointing that's in each other. Refuse to allow anything to come and get in the way of the anointing. Protect it with your life, because in protecting that anointing, you'll find your life. You'll find your life in protecting that anointing. You're going to 
be the best mom. You're going to be the best mom. You are. You're going to be a phenomenal father. And there are spiritual children in your future. There are spiritual children in your future. You're going to birth them by faith. You're going to birth them by faith. Raquel, I see you in, in a bedroom crying. Crying out to God. And the Lord won't show me what you were crying out for, but he said, I just, I see you in a bedroom, like, seems like it's two o'clock in the morning or one o'clock in the morning, somewhere in there where everybody else is asleep, and it's just you in this bedroom, can't sleep, and you're crying out to God. Whatever that was about, the Lord says he, he heard you. He heard every moment. He heard every word. Every word. Every word. He heard it. He heard it. He heard it. He heard it. And I, and I hear in my spirit the story where he told Daniel, when you first prayed, the angel was dispatched. And that angel did not stop at your house. That angel went straight to work fighting the principalities and the powers that were controlling that thing. And I hear in my spirit, he's prevailed. He's prevailed. And your prayers are answered. Your prayers are answered. So, Father, lay your hands on her. Father, in the name of Jesus. God, I call forth the household of their dreams as they combine their vision together and submit it to you, God. I pray that you would do exceedingly abundantly above all that they could ask, think, or imagine. God, that you would fill everything, everywhere with yourself. And Father, that you would move mightily on them. God, that they would see the hand of Almighty God doing the miraculous and the supernatural. And Father, right now, I lift up every faith project and I call that faith project complete in Jesus' name. I call it complete in Jesus' name. And Father, I, I say that their house will be a house where the sound of heaven will be heard in abundance. Heard in abundance. Heard in abundance. The preaching of the word and the singing of the word. The teaching of the word and the singing of the word. The hearing of the word and the performing of the word. The prophetic anointing of the psalmist and that pastor anointing that's on you will combine. And there will be out of Rebecandele Bostila Maseke, Nosta la Basanda la Brook de Benguita, and the Loromos de Bicanda la Vosanda, and the Bestula la Mosecre Matara Basota, and you'll dodge that, and the Bromo Sucruno no Moside, and the Beseke, you'll step right over that, and the Ramastecla na Mastuna la Basete, Romono la Moseke, and the Mianda la Basonda, Recte de Vista, Zunde le Breque. Because when you put your hand to it, when you put your hand to it, the force of righteousness will change it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yeah, Lord, I hear that. I hear that. I hear that. Yeah. You've got phenomenal spiritual parents. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Phenomenal spiritual parents. If you ever, if you ever need to talk to anyone, you go to them and you now have access to come to us if you'd like. You just let us know. You just let us know. Because listen. Listen, in the household of faith, in the household of faith, wisdom is found in a multitude of counsel. 
wisdom. And I don't think I'm going to say anything different than what he's going to say. But it's about interpretation. I may say it different. She may say it different. But we're always going to line up with what they say. So I don't want you to hear that as a you get to pick one or the other. No, it don't work that way, girl. I'll send you back. But I want you to understand that you're covered. You're covered. And I'm just going to say this, and I don't even know who's watching, and then we're going to go eat, okay? I don't care how many divorces you've seen. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come nigh your dwelling. It won't come near you. It won't come near you. It will not come near you. And you are to, by the direction of the Holy Ghost, remove the word from your vernacular. It's not an option. It's not an option. Because you're not just called to minister to each other. That's the most important ministry that you have. But the demonstration to those who are watching you. There will be those who say, we want to be just like y'all. And the weight of weight of that but you've been constructed and built up by people to be able to withstand that weight you have what it takes to stand under that weight glory to God glory to God hallelujah